So when I was an undergrad, I noticed a very strange coincidence that uh, the three best professors I had all did their PhD in the 1970s. And now it's been well documented by others that there was a profound shift in the business model of the American university after the 1970s. So the 1980s is when you started to see the number of students accepted go through the roof. Um, Tuition charged started to go through the roof. Uh, The student loan thing started to become a much bigger problem. And the standard of education dropped rapidly because before the um, administration of a university tended to be done by professors in the same way that a professor will take on the extra administrative duty of being chair of a department, but he or she is still ultimately just a professor. Whereas in the 80s, they started to bring in um, people from the the corporate world to run the university like a Fortune 500 um, business with a name towards profit and customer satisfaction and all of that nonsense. And of course, we have the state now at the university where, you know, it's going to cost you $150,000 $150,000 for a bachelor's degree, but the standard of education is so low that when you get out, you might as well have um, you know, spent four years uh, drunk on a cruise ship is how one professor put it. Um, the outcome is going to be the same. So the vicious cycle of you, know, you spend a mind-blowing amount of money to uh, get something that doesn't even qualify you to flip burgers at the end. And that was a conscious decision by these um, administrators who wanted to run the university like a cruise ship. But um, to get back to the uh, point of this video, uh, those professors I had, uh, was very fortunate enough to have before um, some of them actually retired by now, uh, who did their dissertation in the 70s, I had spent several years wanting to find any publications. And the thing about uh, dissertations written in the 1970s is there's no PDF. So a guy who writes a dissertation in like 2016, for example, if if he doesn't have an embargo on it, which you know often they do in order to get it published, but if he doesn't have that embargo, and the embargo is usually just temporary anyway, you can just download the PDF. Uh, but with dissertations in the 70s, The only way really to find them is to uh, have them located at the university where the dissertation was written back in the 1970s and obtained through interlibrary loan. And one of my professors from undergrad who was the uh, analytic professor, but also the medieval professor on um, campus, he was a a brilliant um, Wittgenstein, actually, scholar who wrote his dissertation on Wittgenstein's notion of private sensation. I actually managed to get that through interlibrary loan my last semester of graduate school four years ago, and I wanted to do a video on that because I feel that a text like this, um, unfortunately, is probably not going to get exposure to the public any other way in that it's probably um, still sitting on that shelf at the university library and uh, will continue to for um, a while without uh, getting out to the public. So I want to talk about the way that um, for Wittgenstein, any discussion of private sensation is going to be contingent upon a discussion of Wittgenstein's notion of grammar in the later works. The thing is, for Wittgenstein, um, he certainly meant grammar in an idiosyncratic sense, different from any mundane notion of how that word might be used. And there's actually still some disagreement in Wittgenstein's scholarship about what exactly he meant by the word grammar. One widely held idea was that Wittgenstein uses the terms grammar and logic interchangeably. But that is deeply misleading because um, to say that Wittgenstein meant logic in its mundane sense is also incorrect. He also had an idiosyncratic use of the word logic. So for starters, the areas where Wittgenstein cares about grammar are in areas where something other than an empirically verifiable proposition is being dealt with. Empirical claims of the mundane kind are, of course, verifiable in experience, and the test for that is pretty simple. One either verifies that it is the case, or one verifies that it's not. Yet there are certain things that are sayable within language which mislead you into thinking that what is being talked about is an empirically verifiable fact of the kind I just mentioned, when in reality what is being dealt with is just grammar. 
The difference is that the negation of the latter is not so much false, it's not empirically false, that is, as it is impossible. That is, the negation of um, dealing with the latter sense of grammar, the negation of that is nonsense, which is in principle excluded from the rules of language itself. A scholar by the last name of Pohl that my professor cites gives a correct example, yet misleading explanation when he cites the law of the excluded middle. While it is true that Wittgenstein thinks that the law of the excluded middle is an example of the type of grammatical rather than empirical stuff just cited, Paul takes the easy way out by saying that it's just mundane logic. That is all that Wittgenstein means by grammar. Yet Wittgenstein goes beyond the scope of mundane logic by also including math. So it's clear that no mundane, narrow, everyday definition of logic can do as a definition. One very rough and yet acceptable definition is to see grammar as a type of network of conceptual connections formed by linguistic rules. Wittgenstein is very careful though, about the way that grammar is more the study of use than it is an extrinsic or supplementary system of rules themselves. So in grammar, we describe the rule of use rather than trying to go to a higher level of explanation that is somehow extrinsic to the understanding of use. It's standard to say that meaning and use are basically interchangeable terms for the later Wittgenstein, but my professor shows us a few citations directly from Wittgenstein himself to say that the application of a word is not everywhere bounded by rules. In fact, it is precisely an understanding at what points the use of a word is indeterminate and not rigidly bound by rules that we're really investigating the properly grammatical analysis of that expression. In fact, Wittgenstein's point is exactly to emphasize the fluidity of use, and the notion of a corresponding series of rigidly defined rules of use is precisely a distortion of that. It's also important to note that there is not a set of all empirical and then a set of all grammatical expressions that is reducible simply to the string of words in themselves. That is to say, the string of words is not intrinsically or absolutely either one or the other. One reason for that is that Wittgenstein cared about linguistic practice within communities. That is, by default, the practice within which the same concept, seemingly, is open to change both in meaning and in how it is used by the community. In the Blue Book, for example, he distinguishes criterion and symptom in linguistic practice. Criteria is essential, but symptom is concomitant. For example, even use is indeterminate. Is one performing a rule, or is one generating a rule that might influence future moves by others? So finally, a string of words is not intrinsically grammatical, nor is a string of words intrinsically empirical, so much as it's the attitude of the speaker and the audience which determine which it is. There are cases, of course, where one uses a sentence such that the attitude is that the empirical criteria might be used to contradict it. That would be an empirical case. But this is not how we always or even necessarily would use that particular sentence. Many people who write on grammatical propositions say that Wittgenstein himself said that they are nonsense or sinnlos, senseless. For example, a necessary proposition is kind of senseless in that there's no way it ever could be compared with reality. That is, can you really verify such a thing empirically or denounce it empirically? So therefore, a necessary proposition is kind of without sense. It's kind of sinnlos. One criteria for this view is the principle of significant contrast. In order for any statement to be meaningful, it's negation must also be meaningful. With grammatical propositions, whose opposite is excluded from language itself, if you remember the definition at the beginning of the video, that would seem to drastically fail the test. But while contradictions of the logical kind are indeed nonsense, would the same hold for tautologies? The problem is that the opposite of the tautology is nonsense, so the opposite of the opposite 
or the double negation, if you remember from the logical operator, changing T to F with a second negation changes it back to T, for example. The problem was with the negation of negation of a tautology um, um, would lead you not to, um, from tautology to nonsense, but rather itself would be nonsense, even though intuitively it seems to restore us back to the meaningful tautology itself. My professor therefore argues that in many ways this understanding is too rigid to be counted in with Wittgenstein's later work, which is really all about the concept of fluidity. Later Wittgenstein, for example, noted that if an expression has a use, that is, if it accomplishes something in language, we don't have the right to simply call it nonsense, do we? Of course, much of this depends on how a grammatical statement is being used. For example, there are times when they are used obviously in order to express something about how to use a rule. In that case, we can't exactly say that they're nonsense. But the most important thing to understand is how exactly Wittgenstein understood the relation between language and the facts of the world. The central theory here is the autonomy of grammar, and because of its obscurity of representation in secondary literature, my professor devotes some time to defining that term, the autonomy of grammar. We got a few dichotomies here. First of all, the dichotomy between a grammatical proposition versus an empirical proposition. We also have the dichotomy of concept versus fact. And finally, the dichotomy of conceptual questions versus empirical questions. But my professor said that these are not really dichotomies because certain empirical facts absolutely are relevant to our use of some grammatical propositions while not making the two the same thing. For example, in expressions we make ourselves um, about whether or not we as individuals privately feel pain, the empirical fact of whether we actually do feel pain is completely relevant without making I feel pain an empirical proposition as such. So to define the autonomy of grammar, we need, for example, the notion that grammar is arbitrary. To say that grammar is arbitrary and therefore autonomous is that there is no extra-linguistic justification that we can meaningfully give as the explanation for why we use a particular rule. Intuitively, we just think that the justification is empirical reality itself. Let's just say that I say something about the fact that nothing can be two different colors in exactly the same place at the same time. I'd think that the empirical fact is the justification, but its negation is still meaningful somehow. Therefore, a grammatical proposition is not simply justified by a particular fact out there in the empirical world. Wittgenstein himself gives a fascinating analogy for why grammar is arbitrary, while other activities are not. So, an activity with a clear goal, like cooking, is one where if you follow the rules wrong, the end product is you have ruined the food. Whereas in playing chess, if you follow the rules wrong, or if you follow rules that don't exist for that game, then you're no longer playing chess, now you're playing a different game. Language is unique in that if you follow rules other than rule X and Y, for example, for language, it's not that you've done something wrong, it means that you're merely speaking about something else. Wittgenstein argues that empirical facts can be relevant to grammatical claims while not being the evidence for the truth value of a grammatical claim. That's a very subtle but extremely important distinction. Alternative language games means perhaps not so much the formation of alternative concepts as the adoption of alternative grammars. So what does he mean then? Really just that the relation between empirical facts and autonomous grammar is, while being a relation, not a relation of correspondence. Arbitrariness really means, therefore, that no one grammar is absolutely correct or incorrect, and no proposition describing a grammar can therefore be true or false. There's no truth value here in the traditional logical sense. So now we can finally get to the crystal clear reason all of this has been leading up to. Grammatical propositions are not about empirical reality, if by that one means that they're absolutely either true or false, or that they are absolutely used 
either correctly or incorrectly. Yet to say that grammatical propositions are complete and willfully blind to facts and reality, as some scholars have made the mistake of doing, is also not really true. For example, take the case of epistemic privacy. One of the most controversial parts of the philosophical investigations by Wittgenstein is the concept of epistemic privacy. A lot has, of course, been written on the private language hypothesis, the idea that no one can have a private language. That's an inherent impossibility. The idea that the solution to the privacy of sensation is contingent upon paying greater attention to its connection with autonomous grammar is what the dissertation has to offer in contrast with much of existing Wittgenstein scholarship. Basically, if one understands it this way, then Wittgenstein's view on the matter will be resolved to be, uh, will be revealed to be much less bizarre and paradoxical than people often describe it to be. The first thing in philosophical uh, investigations that Wittgenstein basically attacks is the view that sensations are private objects. Private either epistemically, that is, no one else can know my pain, or private in terms of ownership, no two people can have the same pain. This is a clear distinction. But of course, the existing scholarship falls quite short doing justice to the problem. This concludes video one. I hope that there can be a video two. Let me know if you'd like that.